and unfortunately, and I, and I always try to be very careful because I know that the majority of the men and women in uniform are good people, but you want to paint it with a broad brush. But the problem in policing in this country is you have a few people that are very racist. And then, you know, the rest of us, we all have our own implicit biases, right? It doesn't matter what race you are, right? But then in policing, you have sort of this, this blue wall, if you will, that it's, it's almost heresy to report criminal behavior, bad behavior by another cop. So even cops know that this person here may be bad news and he or she is a racist and all that other stuff, but no one reports it, right? And I think that what you saw in the George Floyd case was the, the quicentennial problem with American policing. This is Startup the Storefront. Today's guest is George Gascon, a Democrat running for the office of Los Angeles District Attorney. To quote an editorial from the LA Times from October of last year, there is a strong case to be made that aside from the presidential race, the most important item before voters in 2020 will be the race for LA County DA. The reasoning behind such a bold prediction is centered on the relatively high incarceration rates in LA County. The two-term incumbent, Jackie Lacey, has made a name for herself as being tough on crime. So when George Gascon entered the race running on a platform to end mass incarceration, death penalty, and to enact police reform, people took notice. His platform has only increased in relevance since the death of George Floyd instigated America's racial reckoning. Gascon has since garnered the support of progressives such as Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, as well as musicians John Legend and Common. So listen in as we cover everything from how he's running his campaign during the age of social distancing, the difficulties of changing structural problems within policing and how he plans to change them, and we go into the specifics of his plan to completely reform LA's system of mass incarceration. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's show, a very important conversation with LADA candidate, George Gascon. George, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Dave. How are you? Good, man. Crazy times. I wanted to start this conversation with, you know, we're, we're big on the entrepreneurship community. To me, things are always, they're down to the human condition. And so I just wanted to hear a little bit about your story. We know you were, you were born in Cuba. Uh, you moved to Cudahy, but would love to just get a sense of how you immigrated here and uh, where you landed, where you went to high school, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So, you know, I, I grew up in a working class family in Cuba and, and, and obviously here. My father actually was a, um, he was really a pro-democracy guy. So he fought really hard with Bati uh, against Batista uh, in support of Fidel Castro. Then Fidel Castro and the revolution won and he, he was, you know, he thought he had arrived. And then pretty soon, of course, the whole concept of free elections and democracy went down, uh, went down the toilet. So then he became anti-Castro and uh, that led to you know our family going through a lot of problems uh, it, uh, he we tried multiple times to leave on a boat that never worked uh, and then eventually we left in uh, 1967 through I think all the freedom flights uh, it was straight from Cuba to Miami but my family was already living in Cudahy so we literally were in Miami overnight and came straight to LA. Uh, and that's kind of where I grew up. You know, I started a uh, very humble uh, one bedroom apartment. I used to sleep on the couch uh, in the living room. Initially went to Southgate Middle School, but I was a non-English speaker. So I got moved to Nimitz in Huntington Park. They had a program for non-English speakers. And then from uh, middle school, we went to Bell High School and I was still struggling with the language and eventually dropped out of school. And, you know, just went on through a, a two or three years of kind of like a lot of young people do sort of aimlessly uh, wandering around, if you will, and uh, joined the army uh, when I turned 18. And the army was kind of the place where I sort of started to have my life, you know, kind of come together in a better place. So I got my high school diploma. I started actually attending college while I was in the army. And when I got out of the Army, I went to Cal State Long Beach uh, with the intent of becoming a history teacher, got my bachelor's in history. But during that time, I had a friend that had joined the LAPD and he came from the neighborhood that I grew up. And, you know, one thing led to the other and I joined the LAPD and I, uh, 
you know, uh, did well, but also struggled with the culture of the LAPD and things like use of force and, you know, having, you know, an incident where I did not use force, uh, deadly force, someone that was going for my partner's gun, we got it under control and being reprimanded for not using force. So it was kind of like a weird moment in my life where I thought I did something that was worthy of recognition, not, not reprimanding, but... Uh, but, you know, I, uh, listen, I grew up within the organization, promoted all the way to number two, and I had my own evolution in policing, you know, going from, you know, certainly being part of the system to increasingly becoming more uncomfortable with the system to, to then becoming somewhat on the reform side and now, you know, going beyond that, I think. You know, and I, uh, I was the number two guy in the LAPD running operations. I got recruited, went to uh, Mesa, Arizona to be a chief of police, third largest city in the state, and the city is extremely politically conservative. Uh, within Maricopa County, which is a county that you had the guy named Joe Arpaio who was a sheriff at the time, and he was a very anti-immigrant individual, and we started really bumping heads, uh, not only in law enforcement circles, but around the community. It led to my joining two other individuals, a former attorney general of the state and a former mayor of Phoenix to launch a formal complaint with the U.S. Justice Department about the abuses that were going on in Maricopa County against the uh, Latino community and overall just the human rights violations that were going on in the jail system. And that led me to be asked uh, to provide testimony at the U.S. Congress about the abuses. And by the time I got done with that, I was asked to leave Mesa because the political heat that was coming up, not so much from our community, but from other parts of the country, sort of the xenophobic movement, the anti-immigrant movement that was very, very prevalent then in Arizona, obviously now nation, nationwide. And so that led me to, you know, Newsom was then the mayor of San Francisco. I was recruited. I became a chief of police there. And then Kamala Harris was running for attorney general. I helped out a little with her campaign. And when she became the attorney general, I was given the opportunity to be appointed with, and then run twice and got elected. But as I mentioned earlier, my own evolution in the system, I had come to the conclusion years prior that the criminal justice system over incarcerated people. I mean, there was not necessarily a, a return on the investments either socially or in terms of public safety or financially. I think we were breaking the bank, we were building more prisons than we were building schools. So by the time I became a district attorney, I was very focused on being able to show that you could both lower incarceration and have community safety. And there were groups of people that had been working for years already, and we saw that as the opportunity. So that's why sometimes people refer to me as a godfather of progressive prosecutors, because in 2011, the term had not been coined, and there was a lot of work that was going the other way. It still was a time that, you know, district attorneys got elected on tough on crime platforms. And I immediately started to work on lower incarceration, campaigning against uh, three strikes, uh, campaigning against the death penalty, eventually other criminal justice reform. And that's sort of, you know, my trajectory, you know, bumping into some heavy racism in the San Francisco Police Department uh, that was manifested by a bunch of uh, text messages that became public of, you know, officers really using despicable language to refer to African-Americans and, and LGBTQ uh, members of our community and the Latino and uh, having to dismiss a lot of cases, starting an investigation on that, you know, really going to head with the police union and the police department. And so that's kind of, you know, my, my evolution. And then when I finally decided not to run for a third term in San Francisco and come back home. My family's all here. I immediately start getting calls from people. So would you run against Jackie Lacey? What month did people start asking you? Yeah, it was in late 2018. I announced that I was not going to run and don't, don't hold me to the exact time, sure. but I announced that I was not going to run for a third time, third term around October, September of 2018. And in fact, you know, a lot of my supporters said, well, why don't you wait a little longer? I said, look, I want to give other people the capacity to run uh, because it takes a while to build up uh, a campaign. And I, and, you know, frankly, I helped Chase of Boudin, who became, who was a former public defender, who became a friend, a friend and now the district attorney in San Francisco. And then after that, I started getting some calls, you know, but both from people around the nation and around the state and some people 
in LA, uh, and I want to say by December of 2018, roughly, were some conversations. But you know, those conversations continued through early part of 2019, and I still hadn't decided whether to do it or not. And it was really finally by you know close to October 2019 that my wife and I said, okay, we're we're going to do this. And you know, Chase's race was well in its way. I wanted to make sure they had a good good opportunity to get elected which he did. And then we moved here late October and immediately mounted a campaign. We're able to, you know, do extremely well for such a short period of time. Got the, a lot of endorsements from, you know, the County Democratic Party and many other organizations. Got environmentalists, got, you know, Democratic parties from around the county. Uh, got quite a few elected officials, including Maxine Waters, uh, Kamala Harris, Tony Cardenas, uh, Gil Cedillos, uh, Mike Bonning, and, you know, we build up on that. Uh, obviously, we came in number two in the primary, which is, that was always a hope. We knew that right. going up against an incumbent, it would be, what you wanted to do was push for a runoff. And, you know, we've continued, you know, we now got Bernie Sanders, we got Elizabeth Warren, we got uh, Julian Castro. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I see there's a tremendous amount of momentum, you know, occurring and there's so much happening in America. From your standpoint, running a campaign during COVID-19, what, what on earth is that like, right? You're using Zoom, <laughs> I imagine. I know you did the, uh, you did something with John Legend yesterday. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, I got to imagine, I mean, I just wanted to get a window into what on earth this has been like for you. Obviously, you're, you know, being front and center, being in the public is key but it's a massive risk also for you. The last thing you want or anyone on your team is to contract or get this virus. And then, yeah. you're, you know, you, there's only one of you, right? You can't clone yeah, yourself. Exactly. So. exactly. Actually, Diego, you, you, you actually raise uh, the point that, that, that we live with every day, right? People say, hey, I want to meet with you in person. Sure. And we're saying, hey, look, I mean, you know, we want to not put you at risk. I mean, I don't know if I'm a carrier. We don't, you don't know if you're a carrier. Um, but it's only one of me, right? And, and we have a campaign that also we, we try to be very judicious with our expenditures, so we're running very thin. We have a lot of volunteers, but, you know, at the end of the day, I'm the guy running. So we do a lot of Zoom, you know, and, and frankly, there, as you will know, there hasn't, we in our generation, we certainly haven't experienced anything like this, right? Political campaigns are always about shaking hands and going to events and meeting people face to face. And now we're doing it the way that you and I are talking today, right? So the good thing was that uh, I'm, I've always been an, an early adopter of technology and, and we have a very young team. So we very quickly adapted to the digital world and started to do a lot of, you know, what we're doing right now in talking to community groups. We've had town halls where we had 300 people on Zoom or more actually. And we did the same thing with fundraisers, right? You know, we started doing virtual fundraisers and we do now quite a few of those. And interestingly enough, at the beginning, people were saying, well, you know, people won't give you money if they don't get to meet you and stuff. But, but we're finding the contrary. People are giving money. And then, you know, frankly, we're getting a lot of low-level donations online, which is really indicative of this is really a movement. So we got, you know, people that normally wouldn't, would not give to a political candidate. One, two, they may not be able to afford it. And they're giving $10, $20, $50, $5, which to me, that's really, uh, it, it's a testament to the to well, it's important. The movement. I mean, yeah. yeah, I think this is probably going to be the one of the most watched campaigns and elections in, in recent times. I just want to jump into something that has top of mind for everybody. So we, we, we've all witnessed what has happened to George Floyd. And the, the concern I have with that case is there's a tremendous amount of people. It's almost like religion where you have, you know, you have the God and you have the, the Judas, the, the, you know, the person that everyone wants to just see hung. Right. And there's yeah. a mob mentality around it. And there's no doubt we saw massive injustice. There's no question that that happened. But the, the thing that concerns me and, and the reason I wanted to talk to you is because you have an emphasis on policy. Right. And so when I watched the George Floyd video, was it policy that failed him, the entire Minneapolis Police Department, or was it wrongdoing by one individual? Right. And so when, when you watch that, what do you think about as it relates to police brutality and how this has just opened up everything? Yeah, look, I think it's a combination of things, but I think, you know, 
it's hard to walk away from the underlying fact that racism has been so embedded in the criminal justice system and in policing in this country, right? And you have to kind of walk back a little. I know people get very uncomfortable when I say this, but the reality is the origins of policing in this country and many parts of the country are really a product of slavery, right? And it was, you know, the early iterations of policing in many parts of the South, especially, were to work there to make sure slaves were, runaway slaves were returned, right? And slaves were punished. And then after the uh, Civil War, then, you know, there were people that were unhappy with the outcome and they wanted to make sure that you kept vestiges of slavery. So then policing was more formalized around really maintaining a, a very pr oppressive process when it came to race. And then really the evolution of that, you know, it has been one of policing always being not necessarily in the best light when it comes to the African-American community and other poor communities. And I think you sort of then get, get into the last 30, 40 years with a war on drugs, which is really, in many ways, there was a war on poor people and a war on black and brown people, because those were the ones that started being incarcerated over and over again for things that, quite frankly, would go on in other communities without any, any consequences. And policing then again, you know, became part of that war, right? And we militarized our policing. You know, it's, it's funny that I've, uh, recently the, the LA Times had a piece and they said, you know, back in the 80s, when the, the, the crack epidemic started to surface, we were out of fork as a country and, you know, and, the, and drug problems were building up in other parts of the world. And some countries decided to go into the public health approach to drug use and mental health. We actually took the other fork and we decided we're going to militarize our police. We're going to hire more cops, and we're so we went in the rampage, you know, of hiring more cops. You know, then you know the Clinton administration came in, hired 100,000 cops, more prosecutors, more money into policing, more militarization of policing. You know, uh, more punitive, more prisons, and all that stuff. And we, I mean, we went off the scale to the point that as a nation we incarcerate more people than any other nation in the world not only per capita, but in raw numbers. And we have become more punitive than probably most other parts of the world. And we got very comfortable in that, that endeavor. And, you know, district attorneys and chief of police definitely became based on their tough and crime attitudes. And I think a lot of that really was visited upon the African-American community. And unfortunately, and I, and I always try to be very careful because I know that the majority of the men and women in uniform are good people, but you don't want to paint it with a broad brush. But the problem in policing in this country is you have a few people that are very racist. And then, you know, the rest of us, we all have our own implicit biases, right? It doesn't matter what race you are, right? But then in policing, you have sort of this, this blue wall, if you will, that it's, it's almost heresy to report criminal behavior, bad behavior by another cop. So even cops know that this person here may be bad news and he or she is a racist and all that other stuff, but no one reports it, right? And I think that what you saw in the George Floyd case was the, the quicentennial problem with American policing. Here's a man that is dying in front of you, right? I mean, we can all see this happening. You even got one officer is talking about, oh, geez, I thought of, you know, this thing about positional asphyxia. Is, is he really breathing, right? And they stand by and they don't do anything at all, right? And this man dies. And there is not only the man that actually does this horrendous, it's a murder. There's no other way to put it. But you got, you got these other cops that are complicit by doing nothing about it. And, you know, while this is in video and we all see it and we get horrified, I can tell there are hundreds of other, thousands of other cases that have happened in the last few years that do not capture attention and, and we just can't walk away from racism in the system. Yeah, so, so what is the best way to change that? Because a lot of the public has focused on either defund the police or training policy. But the Washington Post just came out with an article about how tough just changing a training program actually is. Because two of the four officers in the George Floyd murder that just stood by were newly out of the academy. I think they had only been on the streets for about three months. So they had gone through this reformed and revamped training process, which centered on de-escalation, 
and uh, nonviolent approaches. But the Post was interviewing former police chiefs and police officers who recalled that once you're out of the academy, and maybe you can shed some light on this if this is true for everywhere or not, but once you're out of the academy, every rookie, for the most part, gets a talking to from their training officer where it's like, this is what you learn in the academy and this is how it actually is on the streets. And so you are more inclined as a rookie, you are more inclined to go along with your training officer because if they've been on the force for 10, 15, 20 years, odds are they've, they've got experience and they've seen some things, so you're likely to trust them. So how, how can we change our police departments to go against this, this kind of power structure here where if, if these rookies, these three month rookies on the force can then speak out against Derek Chauvin who had been on the force for 19 years and was a training officer, how do you fight against that kind of structural policy? Yeah, and you know, you, you ask an interesting question, and I think it's important to contextually put this up, right? So I was a police officer in the field. Uh, I was a training officer. I rolled through the ranks. I actually run LAPD training, and I did it during the time where LAPD was going through a consent decree, then actually create training in response to the consent decree. And I was a strong believer that training was going to alter the culture of the LAPD, and I have moved away from that. I don't think the issue with policing is about training anymore. Not to say that training is not important, but you are not going to shift the training of policing in America through training. And that's why I become a very strong advocate that we have to reduce the size of police departments significantly. We have to hold bad policing accountable, and that sometimes is going to require prosecutions when there is criminal behavior. We have to make sure that the laws are evolving to a place where there is a higher level of accountability for police criminal conduct. And I think we have to start creating other verticals around to handle so much other work that doesn't require a batch on the gun. So whether it's a call for mental health, right? 30% of the work of American policing in most communities involves mental health, right? And most of that does not require a batch on the gun. That requires actually a mental health expert. And having those people not work for the police department not wear a police uniform, but work for a county health department or a city health department. Um, start reducing the consequent, you know, creating more and more criminal consequences for crimes of poverty, crimes of addiction, crimes of mental health, right? And start coming with solutions that are not criminal justice oriented to what often are social ills that are driven by poor public health, socioeconomic issues, no housing or, you know, very insufficient housing. You know, these are all the things that I think are going to take us in a different direction. And that's why, frankly, if you recall, I was talking in my own evolution, going from being part of the system, if you will, becoming someone to talk about reform, engaging very actively in reform, to get into a place now that I think, you know, it's not about reform anymore, it's about reimagining. The criminal justice system is about, you know, really understanding the limitations into the system, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I tell people that if you, you know, if you look at, if you were to walk into an operation room uh, for a surgical, medical surgical procedure, the, the people that are there today are going to be people that they basically build their profession on science and experimentation and research. And before they cut, cut into your brain to work in your brain, they're not trying to learn as they go, right? Uh, in criminal justice, you know, we actually, we implement very punitive policies, you know, with district attorneys at the lead of the pack without any understanding or any science behind what we do. You know, we, we, you know, we create new enhancements. We send people to prison for longer periods of time and nobody stops and says, well, does that really work? Because actually it's evidence today that it doesn't work, right? or we prosecute juveniles as adults without stopping and thinking that actually the science says that, you know, our brains are not fully developed until we're about 25. And as we're growing and you're testing and you're, you know, you're a risk taker by nature at that age, well, risk is going to be contextually to your environment, right? If you're surfing and you live in a surfing community, the, the way you take risk as a 19 year old is very different than if you live in an inner city where there are gangs and there are shootings and all that stuff and you have been traumatized as a young kid. 
but the mechanism behind the brain doing all this stuff is the same. And for us to trick that 18 or 19 or 60 or 17 year old as if he or she were an adult is contrary to science. Well, you never will see a doctor doing brain surgery trying to do what we did 100 years ago or 30 years ago or 20 years ago. But, but in the criminal justice system, we do much the same thing, right? So it's not an issue of training. It's not an issue of reform anymore. And I again, I want to underline, training is necessary. But to really make systemic changes, we're going to have to reimagine the way the system works. And we have to, we absolutely have to come to grips with the, the role that race and racism plays into the system. You, you touched on something that I want to jump into. So th- when I look at this uh, race from the outside, it's, it's refreshing in, in a few ways. You have a, an African-American woman and we have a Latino male. And I think, all right, we have some diversity as it relates to this election, which is not, you know, usually the case across America. Right. At the same point, you mentioned something that you mentioned the police. And so defunding the police at present is a, is a headline. And so we see Garcetti moving forward with that. At the same time, it seems like the incumbent, Jackie Lacey, is getting funding from the police. And so now, as it relates to her campaign, I think as humans, right? So humans from the outside, the humans that are ingesting everything that the media is putting out, we're going so hard into defunding the police. I'm not convinced that's the answer. I'm convinced some sort of reform surely needs to happen. Some sort of movement of the funds needs to happen. As you think about this, you mentioned some things around mental health. You mentioned some things around how we as humans, the brain isn't necessarily there until about the age of 25. The hippocampus has to develop. What are some things that you think make the most sense? So whether that's maybe getting more lenient with people under a certain age, or whether that's creating more programs as it relates to mental health, focus more on, at the end of the day, the people that go to jail are coming back, right? They're coming back to families. And so it's like, what are we doing as human? Like, why, where have we gone wrong as a, as a human yeah. race? Not as a race, but as a human race, where it's just, we're just, we're treating these people like they're, they're never coming back to our society. And that's just not the case. And so how do you think about solving that issue? How do we think about the rehab as opposed to the complete, yeah, you know, just yeah. criminalization? So, I mean, several things, by the way, this is an American problem. This is not a a worldwide problem, right? Like the Europeans Mm. have figured out a lot of this much better than we have, right? Portugal decriminalized drug use 23 years ago, and they've had much better results. Most of the European Union has de facto decriminalized drug use. Of course, they have also national health systems, so it's very, very, it's much easier for them to medicalize a problem than for us, right? Uh, We have so many people that do not have access to to medical or health services. But I think that, first of all, I think defunding the police is a term that means very different things to different people, right? There are some people that say 90% should be defunded. Other people are talking about reform. I I think that for me, the issue is more reimagining the whole system. Understanding, first of all, I don't think you can reform a system that is inherently designed to do some things that are not necessarily good for us anymore. They probably never were, but we understand it. So, you know, I I don't think that you can take a horse buggy and make it into a race car, right? It's just not possible, right? And and I'm making that because I'm trying to make some comparisons that illustrate. I just don't think, you know, you cannot put a jet engine on a horse buggy, right? You can put wings on a horse buggy, but it's still going to fall apart when it tries to take off, right? So we have to start from scratch and starting to have an honest conversation. Would we today, I mean, if we were Martians and we came down to earth, would we design our criminal justice system the way that it is today? And I, and I believe the answer would be resoundingly no, right? It's not a system that works. It's a system that, first of all, the failure rate is horrendous, right? I mean, on a good day, we have a 40% recidivism rate. That means that everything that we touch, about 40% goes wrong. Now, would you be willing to walk into an airport and jump on an airline that the, the, the person checking you and says, by the way, you have a 40% chance that this thing is gonna fall off the sky? My I, mean, I know it's an absurd question, but you know, we wouldn't, right? But, but we do that, we spend billions, and well, we spend trillions of dollars, right? In a criminal justice system that doesn't work, you know, in prisons, you know, 
We know the things that work. We know that public health work. We know that education works. In fact, you want to know one of the biggest predictors of someone not committing a crime? Give them a high school diploma, put them in college, and give them housing. But yeah, we spend, you know, we send juveniles out of clip or in the state of California almost $300,000 a year to house a juvenile in a custody facility or, or a single adult spending eighty to $100,000 a year. And you shake your head and you said, you know, where do we go wrong? Because that's not a national, that's not an international problem. It's an American problem, right? How do you start over? Do you fire everybody? Like, how do you, well, how do you do uh, that? Yeah, obviously, I mean, I, I, I don't think you can do that, right? So it's got to be, it has to be a gradual thing, but it has to be a gradual thing with a very clear understanding that the objective is not to continue to polish the, the corners, if you will, is to really reimagine the system, right? So there are certain things that you can take out of the policing immediately. Okay, that 30% or so of calls that are mental health related, create, take that money away from the police department, put that money into public health and create a network of first responders that do not look like a cop and that are medically trained to respond to that. Now that might take you in some counties, you may be able to do that in six months or a year. So counties may take you two or three years, but you start taking that money away. You get district attorneys that start not incarcerating people for pre-trial low-level offenses or non-serious, non-violent offenses. You know, about 50% of people in any county jail are there for pre-trial reasons. They haven't been deemed to be guilty yet, but they're there because they're poor, they cannot afford to pay bail. Right, so mm-hmm. get rid of money bail. Get rid of that forty or fifty percent. Put them out on the street. Let them come to the day in court, whatever the day in court looks like. That will have a tremendous impact on our jail population. That will also have a tremendous impact on whether we need to have more jails. We could actually reduce that. Right? We try and we prosecute a lot of cases that don't need prosecution. You know, we should not be prosecuting people because they have a drug addiction. And they have a mental health problem, right? So divert those people away from the system immediately. So if you start very methodically, but very clearly and very sure-footed about where you're going, you start the process of what I used to call, actually, it's funny because somebody called me there, they said, well, you've been talking about reducing the footprint of the system for years. Isn't that defunding? And I said, well, yeah, it's another way of calling about defunding, right? I've been talking about let's reduce the footprint of the system there is a minimal number of things that require a batch in the gun. And what we need to do is slowly get us out there, but we got to do it. We cannot keep talking about it. And what I'm fearful is that we keep talking about, we'll, we'll create more training, more diversity. None of that stuff is going to work. And the perfect example, you know, you cited it very well, Nick, when you talk about, you, know, you had three rookie officers just out of the academy with a senior guy. They all clearly went through the most recent training, arguably the escalation, all that stuff, they stood by and did nothing. You know why? Because the culture and the structure of the system is what it is. The one thing I wanted to ask you about too, so in 2016, Prop 62 was here in California for around the death penalty. Similar to your plane analogy, I think 4% of the people that get the death penalty are found to be innocent years later as a human being, I'm still like, why are we talking about the death penalty? To me, it just seems so ludicrous, honestly. And so this is something that you and the incumbent differ on, right? Right. And so I just want people to hear your thoughts, frankly, on, on the death penalty and, and what is it like, why, why is this thing still around? Yeah. So, I mean, let me begin by, by full disclosure. I am morally opposed to the death penalty. So understand that you can put that bucket wherever you want it. I, but here are the things, here are the reasons why the death penalty doesn't work, aside from morality. We know that it doesn't deter crime, right? I mean, there are many studies that have shown that the, the death penalty has zero deterrent on crime. So when we are following the death penalty, we at least have to be honest and say, okay, it's not because it's going to make us safer. It won't, right? Uh, it, may be, it may feel good, an eye for an eye, but, but it's certainly not making it safer, which is one of the reasons why the criminal justice system is there. I mean, criminal justice system should not be out there to seek retribution, right? So it doesn't make us safer. We know that it's tremendously expensive. I mean, into the billions of dollars, right? If you were to amortize the cost of a 
execution, if there were to happen an execution in California, that would be about $300 million, one execution. Wow. And wow. we had the biggest, we had the biggest death row in the country, about 750 people. In fact, a third of those nearly enough come from LA County and the current district attorney has put 22 people there just in the last five or six years. So we know that it's very expensive. It really breaks the bank. Wow. Then we have the problem with wrongful convictions to the point that you made earlier, Diego, about 4% of the people that get convicted, and in some places, by the way, it's a higher number, are wrongfully convicted, right? So you know that you could put somebody in death row that may not be the person that did it. And then we know that it's irreversible, right? I mean, we haven't figured out a way to bring you back alive. Once, it, once you die, you, you're dead, right? So, so you have to say, okay, the, the failure rate is possible and it's significant. And that failure rate creates an irreversible harm, right? Death of someone that was innocent. It's very costly and it doesn't do anything. Just to switch gears from your perspective, has AI been at all or technology as a whole? I mean, one of the things we've been covering on my side is, is looking at AI and its inherent racism that we've seen as of late. And so to the point where I think, I think Google Vision shut down their entire AI division and yeah. has stopped sending or selling, stopped helping cities with crime data because inherently it's, yeah. 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 How do you think about AI? How do you think about, you know, is there any technology that can help in this effort? Well, I mean, are you talking specifically about the death penalty or are we talking about uh, other in crime in general. in general? Yeah, well, look, I mean, we, you know, there there's certainly good applications to artificial intelligence. I'll give you one. In San Francisco, we work with a Stanford computational lab to actually take race and all the proxies of race away from police reports so that prosecutors in the general crime filing team wouldn't know what the race of the person was when they made the first decision. So for instance, uh, let's say that a robbery occurred and I'm gonna use a, create obviously a fictitious type of setting. You have a green person uh, that committed the robbery, but the prosecutor doesn't know that it's a green person, right? The prosecutor's looking at the evidence and all they can see is that, you know, witnesses describe the assailant in this robbery as a person unknown race that was 200 pounds, six feet tall, wearing a white t-shirt and blue jeans. Another person describes it as a person of a slightly different tonality of skin that weighs about 160 pounds and had uh, long hair and it had black pants and a beige shirt or a beige t-shirt. And the prosecutor looks at this and says, well, I really can't make a decision here because I'm not going to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person who's in custody did this, right? So they mark in their system, they say, this case cannot be filed for insufficient evidence. Mm -hmm. Then they unmask the report, and the report now shows clearly a photo of a green person and a video of the green person that is the one in custody committing the robbery. Now the prosecutor said, uh huh, I have enough evidence now to move forward. I'm going to move mm -hmm. the case. So now they, they move forward with the case. And that would be an appropriate way of altering your original decision. But let's take the same set of circumstances. And now the prosecutor unmasked, and you have a really fussy video that shows what it looks like a green person, but not no facial, which are very common, right? Especially. A lot of those business cameras in some places are antiquated. You know, the shot may be bad. The person was wearing a hat, whatever. Right. But the prosecutor said, wait a minute. This is an area where green people commonly commit crimes. And green people, in his or her mind, are more likely to commit crimes than not. So he moves forward. And they kind of, you know, obviously they don't say that on their rationale. But they say, well, you know, we have a video that looks very similar to the person who's being described. And this is an area where green people are regular commit crimes, so therefore we want to move forward with the case. That case would be an inappropriate way of proceeding with a case that would require supervisory approval, and that would be denied. So we use artificial intelligence in that case to first of all do what humans would have a very hard time doing, which is completely decoupling race and all the proxies of race, right? So neighborhoods, 
sometimes names. I mean, Juan Hernandez, we most of us would think of a Latinx, right? right? Or Leroy, right. we may think of a African American, right? So all that gets taken out of the mix. Uh, and that first decision cannot be removed. It stays in the system. And I actually, uh, my commitment was that we would make that technology available to other DAs and that we would share the results of our process over years with researchers and policymakers to see how we can get rid of uh, implicit bias. So that's a good way of using artificial intelligence. Another thing that I did is when Prop 64 passed, that was a legalization of marijuana, the initiative also actually said that the person that had been convicted could go through the application process to have their record sponge or reduced, uh, depending on the conditions of their conviction, but they had to do it on their own. And we looked at it and we said, you know, we learned that about less than six, seven percent of all the people that qualify for record expungement ever actually apply for it because it's cumbersome. It takes time, it takes money. Right. And poor people don't get to do that. Right. But right. we also know that a criminal conviction is going to keep you from getting employment, housing, a whole bunch of things. So in looking at that proposition very closely, we say, it, you know, it says that the person has to do it himself, but it doesn't prohibit the DA from doing it right in mass. So we decided we would do this in mass, and we started it with very laborious, right? And we realized that this is going to take a long time, and I'm trying to push other DAs to do it. And they say, hey, look, I would like to do it, with, but I can't because I don't have the resources. So we went to Code for America, and we developed artificial intelligence to actually review criminal records, determine the people that qualify, and complete all the paperwork necessary to get the relief. You mentioned the legalization of marijuana, and uh, that brings up an interesting point that has been gaining a little bit traction lately. I mean, there have been other issues that have been taking the hot seat, but one of them is uh, now that marijuana is has been legalized in California, you know, we still have a number of people who are locked up for marijuana offenses. And I think Elon Musk tweeted out not too long ago that it's it's telling when marijuana dispensaries are considered an essential business during the quarantine and the lockdown, mm -hmm. but we still have people in jail for marijuana offenses. So I'm curious as a candidate for DA, how we can rectify that situation and, and get these people out of jail and back into society for something that society as, as, a, you know, as a state and growing as a country, we consistently yeah. see as more and more of a, an acceptable and recreational drug. Yeah, you, you need to have DAs that are willing to go back and take those cases and resent them the case and get the people out. The problem is you still have DAs that are fighting the war on drugs. I mean, I can tell you, look, I worked on Prop 36. That was a reform of three strikes in 2012, which basically said the last strike had to be serious and violent because we have people in prison for 25 years to life for a last strike that may, was maybe stealing a loaf of bread from a supermarket, okay? To this day, eight years later, LA County is still fighting some of those releases, right? So these are people that should have been released back in 2012, but the district attorney continues to find ways to, to keep people in. So the problem is you need to have, look, district attorneys have a wide level of discretion. In some cases, too broad. And you can have a DA that will immediately say, like I did, you know, any prior marijuana convictions, you know, out the door, any prior three strikes that qualify for Prop 36 out the door, and you have a DA like here that continues to fight all the things in other DAs in around. So you have to really mandate it. So like we did with marijuana convictions, actually, is we got the state to actually mandate the spongement, uh, and that became effective, will become effective July 1 of this year. But that was after we tried to get district attorneys to do this on their own, and they wouldn't. George, do you think we will see, I know you guys at the LA Times debate, Will there be a Zoom debate? What What are the talks and what this looks yeah. like to and influencing the public as we move forward? Uh, you know, I, I think that I'd like to believe that there will be debates in September, October. I also don't believe that COVID is going to go away September, October. In fact, we're seeing a new wave and I'm being told by by medical friends uh, that are researchers are actually probably by September, October will be even worse than it is now. So. The reality is that social distancing, masking, all this stuff is going to be real. So we're not going to have a, a, an amphitheater or a theater full of people like we did 
uh, for the primary. So I think that, you know, it's a possibility it will be digital or it could be in two different studios or studios with some distance, but, you know, just the cameras there. Uh, but I like to think that there will be debates. I think it's healthy. I think, you know, this is a race actually that really talks about two different people with very different approaches to the work. It's not like we're splitting hairs here and people need to understand the differences. And, you know, the New York Times called this race the second most important race in the country back in November last year. Uh, obviously, the first one being the one for the White House. And the reason why they said that is because they said, you know, LA County being the largest county in the country is such an influencer in what goes on around criminal justice and uh, whether you're a hardcore lock them up district attorney like the one you currently have or whether you have a reformer will have a huge impact. And people in LA County should know that. I agree. And what are some of the key milestones as you get closer to November? So as you plan out, you know, as you and your team plan out the next three months, what are some key things you have to hit? I know COVID throws a whole wrench into this, but yeah. is it is it moving everything to to Instagram, to Facebook, to social media, partnering with influencers, just at a campaign level and the strategy? What are some key dates for you? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, you know, there is no blueprint for this, right? No one has done it before, right. so we're all... So there is no question, obviously, social media is going to be a major player. I mean, we're at least fortunate to have the technology that you and I can do this with relatively inexpensive right. equipment, you know. So that obviously is playing a major role. You know, we're having Zoom town halls where we have three, 400 people, right? You know, obviously, we could not fill a theater today with that many people. So I think that you're going to see this continuing to evolve. I mean, our fundraising, by and large, is going to be also digitally. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of people through social media just clicking in and, and contributing. So, I mean, the, the, the fight is going to continue to be, obviously, fundraising is going to be one, is getting people engaged, especially getting young people engaged. This is a race that is a defining moment for our generation. But the reality is that at the end of the day, it's the young people that are going to be the ones that are going to either have a different future or are going to continue to live in a society like the one that we live. So so it's incumbent upon the 16, 17 years old that may not be able to vote, but at least get to know, but certainly the 18s and above to engage in this in a way that normally people at that age wouldn't be. So, you know, one of the things that I tell a lot of the community organizers and a lot of young people that I work with, I say, look, I mean, I... It's great that you're demonstrating out there, and I, and I support that. But you also have to remember to vote, right? And they're not exclu mutually exclusive. You need to do both. If you want to demonstrate, you do that, but you also need to vote. So to that end, we're, you know, we're increasing our volunteer base uh, continuously. Uh, mm -hmm. We're asking our volunteer base to share with the network so it's a multiplying impact through social media and other influencing ways that we talk to the people that trust us individually. And that's the challenge, just continuing to keep that growing and growing, especially because we have such a large county and we're yeah. going to have so many limitations. And, and just two questions for you as we wrap up. I, obviously, Michelle Obama said, you know, when others go low, we stay high. You've run your campaign so far with nothing but class. Right. As you think about the attack ads that are now being released, you're a human at the end of the day. What is that like? You know, what, what is your strategy? Will you stay focused on, on the topics, on the policy? How do you view that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, look, I see it as a sign of desperation, desperation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, typically that's the kind of stuff that a, a losing candidate will do at the end of the race, you know, hoping that it will damage the other person. And sometimes it works. Uh, but I, I mean, first of all, I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for our former first lady, and I agree with her 100%. When they go low, you go high. We're going to be very policy, very driven on the principles of this campaign. Uh, they want to get down on the gutter. We're going to let them do that. Uh, you know, and interestingly enough, it's them. It is a campaign. It's not like an independent expenditure is doing this, right? Campaigns don't control independent expenditures. They can do whatever they're going to do. But the campaigns control what they do. So the fact that this, this attack ads are very much speaking for you know, Miss Lacey's character, how she views this, but I really view them as a sign of desperation more than anything else. So I let him go low, you know, there's an old saying and no pun intended, you wrestle with a pig and you get muddy and the pig likes it. Uh, I'm not going <laughs> to wrestle with a pig, right? George, listen, I love your story. You know, as an immigrant, you came here, you've done a lot. You're an example to many people. You've been able to ascend to San Francisco DA 
at a minimum, you've, you've impacted a tremendous amount as nothing more than an example. When you think about this race, good, bad, or indifferent, how does George Gascon want to be remembered? Look, I, I hope to be remembered, first of all, as a human being that makes mistakes and learns and grows, right? I, I think that I tell people that when I have somebody that comes to me and they appear to be a perfect person, I always... I'm a little apprehensive because I don't think there is perfection in humanity. And I think actually opening up our own humanity, owning up to our mistakes, learning from them and moving on is important. So I want people to understand that, you know, I am who I am and certainly I'm a human being that will continue to evolve. I hope that if you and I have a conversation four years from now, I would have evolved further and hopefully in a good way. But I'd like, you know, people to, to think of me as someone that is very principle driven. That, that truly cares about what happens to other human beings. Uh, I believe in the, the job as being one that is victim-centered with capital letters, right? You know, the criminal justice system doesn't take care of victims. In fact, the contrary, you know, an eye for an eye, you know, my poking you and taking your eye out because you took mine out doesn't bring my eye back, but maybe getting you to an eye doctor <laughs> And getting that fixed wood. So it's actually being really victim center in a way that we did in San Francisco. We well, we spent a lot of time to repair the harm. We we focus on accountability and repair. And the system generally uh, translates accountability and punishment. And I want us to move away from accountability and punishment, move to accountability and repair. And repairing sometimes means not only working with the victim and helping them, you know, restore or repair the harm but are also understanding the offender because the reality is that most of the victims sometimes become offenders. Most of the offenders for sure were victims before. So dealing with the impact of you know, trauma, especially in childhood and the, the, the impact that it has in your brain development, substance abuse, mental health, social inequalities, inequalities right? The, the, you know, I mean, I think sometimes people speak from a place of privilege that is almost intolerant as how they look at others without ever thinking about what would you do if you were in the same set of circumstances? What would you do if you had no money to eat? What would you do if you were hungry? Uh, what would you do if, you're, if you don't have any medical assistance? I mean, how do you deal with the pressures of that, right? Because it's very easy to be extremely pious when you have never had to do that. You know, I had... I, not long ago, I was listening to a TED Talk, and they had this woman that came up and said, you know, and it was a group primarily of, um, looked like, you know, fairly educated white people, and they said, uh, how many of you had to think about how to pay your phone bill uh, mm -hmm. next month? And, of course, there were no hands raised. And then, you know, she went through a set of circumstances, and it's only a few people at the end that kept their hand raised, and there were, you know, there were poor people of color. And I said, okay, think about all the privileges that you've had in where you are today and understand that you're not there because you're a lot smarter. Uh, you're not there because you were somehow wired better. You're there just because, you know, there was a, a lock of the draw at birth, right? And you happen to be born white and in a, you know, fairly affluent setting or middle class. Somebody else happened to be born poor, possibly black or brown and in a very different setting. And that is the only difference. And when you start thinking about the world that way, you start becoming more tolerant. You start trying to look for solutions that are not based on a, from a place of privilege, but are based from a place of humanity. And how do we all work together to get to a better place? Well, George, I thank you for coming on the podcast. I thank you for sharing a little bit about yourself and the campaign with our community. Just give everyone at the end, you know, a sense of where they can find you, how they can support. Yeah, please. So, you know, you can go to my website. It's really simple. It's my name, George Gascon, and G-U-R-G-E. G-A-S-C-O-N dot org. And you can go in there and you'll see opportunities. First of all, you can see a lot of policy papers. We have a great policy team that obviously they're reflecting my thoughts, but they're uh, very smart people with a very broad base of individuals, not only attorneys, but we have people from every community. And, you know, we have just solid things that we discuss there that would be the, the basis of my administration if I were to be elected. There are opportunities to volunteer if you like the message. If you have the capacity to donate, and by the way, if you can donate the dollar, you can donate $1,500. We like it all because it's all important. You can click in, you can donate online or secondly, you can you know, write a check. Tell others, you know, we have a lot of information there that is very digestible to basically cut and paste and, you know, put it in your social media, tell others, tell your friends. 
you know, I think as human beings, we tend to value more a message that comes from somebody that we know and trust. So I can talk here until, you know, until my ears, uh, you know, go red or whatever. But, you know, having a friend tell you, hey, I believe in some of the concepts that George is talking about, it's going to have a very different impact that coming from me. So if, if you believe in my message, then become a someone that communicates that to others. But, you know, strongly encourage, go on our website, look at what we're talking about. And if all if this rings a bell with you, please get active on it. Appreciate it, George. Thank you so much. Thank you, George. My pleasure. Thank you both. And you guys take care and be safe out there. The start of the storefront team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Megan Conrad, Owen Capolini, Lexi Jameson, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is composed by Double Touch. And we've got more great episodes coming out every week. So if you aren't already, consider subscribing. This is a very supportive and helpful community of entrepreneurs, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Startup Storefront. Because in case you didn't know, we film all of our episodes and release them a day early on YouTube. And you can always go back and listen to any of our other episodes available wherever you get your podcasts and on our website, StartupStorefront.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.